the dead road by Maya Kutu. Oh, had killed the road thereabouts. Hyenas slunk along the tracks, snuffling among ashes and dust. The landscape had blended sadness, the likes of which had never been seen before, in colors that clung to the inside of the mouth. They were dirty colors, so dirty that they had lost all their freshness no longer daring to rise into the blue on the way. Here, the sky had become unimaginable, and creatures had got used to the ground and resigned apprenticeship of death. The road that now unfolds before our eyes crosses no other. It lies more prostrate than the centuries, alone bearing the burden of all distances. Along the road, burnt out cars rot away, the residue of pilage. In the surrounding savannah, only the baobabs contemplate the world shredding its flowers. An old man and a boy make their way along the road. They walk with swaying gait, as if journey has been their only occupation since birth. Their destination is the other side of nowhere. Their arrival and non-departure, awaiting what lies ahead. They are fleeing the war. The war that has contaminated their whole country. They advance under the illusion that somewhere beyond there lies a quiet haven. They walk barefoot. Their clothes the same color as the road. The old man's name is Dwight. He is skinny and seems to have lost all his substance. The boy is called Muidinga. He has been walking ahead ever since he left the refugee camp. He has a slight but noticeable limp. His leg dallying longer than his step. The vestige of an illness that had been but recently dragged him near to death. It was old Dwyer who had taken him in when everyone else had abandoned him. The boy no longer had a country. His snot oozed from his whole head rather than from his nose. The old man had to teach him all the beginnings. To walk, to speak, to think. Muidinga became a little boy all over again. But this second childhood was hurried along by the needs of survival. When they had begun their journey, he was already in the habit of singing, giving vent to his gamely self-amusement. In solitude's company, however, his song eventually migrated from itself. The two travelers matched the road, with it, and devoid of hope. Now Moi Dinga and Dwyer pause before a burnt out bus. They talk and disagree. The boy throws his sack to the ground, arousing the dust. The old man chides him. I'm telling you, boy, we'll set up house right here. But here, in the bus that's all burnt up. You know nothing, child. What's already been burnt can't burn again. Muridinka remains unconvinced. He looks at the plane. Everything seems to have faded. In that land, so devoid of life. To be right is something you no longer care about. For that reason, he does not press his point. He walks round the bus. 
Moidinga leans against the trunk of the tree and asks, But is it more dangerous on the road to one? Isn't it better to hide in the bush? Not at all. Here, we can watch the passers by, don't you see? You always know everything to one. They climb onto the bus. The aisle and seats are still covered with charred corpses. Moidinga refuses to go farther. The old man walks down the aisle, examining the vehicle's nooks and crannies. These people really got toasted. Look how small they ended up. It seems fires like to turn us into children. Come on. These dead have been cleaned by the flames. Moidinga advances slowly, treading with extreme caution. This place has been contaminated by death. It would take a thousand ceremonies to purify the bus. Don't make such a face, boy. The dead get offended if we look at them with disgust. Let's get these corpses out of here. Why should we? Do they smell bad? The boy doesn't answer straight away. He has turned towards the broken window. The old man insists on wasting. They haven't had a break ever since leaving the refugee camp. Moidinga remains with his back to him. All that can be heard is breathing, almost sliding into sobs. Then he repeats his western duty to clean their refuge. I beg you, Uncle Dwyer, it's just that I'm sick and tired of living in among the dead. The old man hastens to correct him. I'm not your uncle, and threatens him. Don't get too familiar, boy. It's only by way of tradition, Moidinga argues. I don't like to hear you use it. I promise never to call you it again. And tell me, why do you want to find your parents? I've already told you a hundred times. I can't understand. Let me tell you something. Your parents aren't going to want to see you, even alive. Why? In times of war, children are a burden that causes lots of problems. The boy shivers. So the tragedy was more recent than he thought. The spirits of the dead must be still hovering around here. But to why he seems oblivious to the surroundings. They buried the last body. They never even see its face. They drag him along as he is, his teeth plowing the soil. After filling the hole, the old man heaves the case up into the bus. Muidinga, open it. Let's see what's inside. They force the lock hurriedly. Inside the case are clothes. A box of food. On top of everything, there are some school exercise books scattered around, scribbled with uncertain letters. The old man lifts out the box with provisions. Moidinga examines the papers. See here, Dwyer, they're letters. The food is what I'm interested in. The boy rummages around in the rest. His inquisitive hands travel into the corners of the case. The old man summons his attention. Better to leave everything as it is and close the lid. Just take out that bunch of papers. It'll do for lighting our fire. The young lad takes out the notebooks. He puts them under his seat. He doesn't seem to want to sacrifice those papers in order to start a fire. He remains seated, lost in thought. Then he sits down by the fireside. 
puts the books in order and begins to read. He hesitates over every letter, traveling the slow curves of each one. He smiles, satisfied with his conquest. He gets used to it and gathers speed. What are you doing, boy? I'm reading. Of course, I'd forgotten. You can read. Well then, read out loud to help me get to sleep. The child reads aloud. His eyes open wider than his voice as it slowly and carefully begins to decipher the letters. Reading was something he was only now starting to remember how to do. Old to wide, ignorant in matters of letters, had not awakened his ability to read. The moon seems to have been summoned by Maradinka's voice. The night is gradually flooded with moonlight, bathed in silver. The row listens to the story as it unfolds from the books. I want to place time.